actually we are living in an unprecedented sri lanka today countries declared bankrupt and has defaulted on payment of debts debts and going on condition of and bailouts from imf this has brought forth debt restructuring and restructuring of public enterprises meanwhile presently the economy seems showing some positive sign and sign of gradual revival inflation has remarkably reduced though the price level stagnates high the same yes no polymers or queues consumer goods are fairly available exchange rates look more or less stabilized while a bit improvement can be seen in the foreign exchange reserves as well however vital questions remain in relation to attempts made to reduce most important trade deficit increasing inflow of dollars and at the same time improving government revenue under this particular background this discussion we believe would be a better piece of awareness and a help to build clear understanding of the real state of affairs in the country today and what is looming for the future to make us aware of these matters we have invited the distinguished lecturer from the faculty of economics and statistics from the university of peradeniya he is none other than professor vasanta atukorala i hope he is not a strange to you all as he ha- as he this days open visit you at your uh, living room discussing making aware and giving comments over economic matters uh, before inviting our lecture today i would like to make a brief introduction on him. vasanta atukorala professor vasanta atukorala holds a doctorate in economics from queensland university of technology australia and mphil and ba honors in economics from the university of peradeniya where he is working as a professor of professor in economics in addition he has completed more than 20 short courses in various countries around the world he has a broader spectrum of research interest which include environmental economics agriculture economics development economics transport economics and sustainable development he has published over 40 research papers in prestigious national and international journals besides he is a co-author of five textbooks in addition he has authored seven book chapters and presented over 45 research papers at national and international conferences despite his broad research interests he is particularly interested in empirical work on development issues and has made a number of significant contributions in this area his work has had and continues to uh, have a significant impact on policy decision in sri lanka professor vasanta atukorla has been named the second best economist in sri lanka by the global ad scientific index 2021 and 2022 given his overall research profile he has been categorized in the top most research category by the university of peradeniya in 2020 this is the highest award a lifetime award that is given to a scholar in the country after evaluating his her uh, research his uh, contribution he has served as a committee member for preparing various policy document in sri lanka some of these committees and their members were directly appointed by the sri lankan presidential office he also in addition to has been working as a consultant on various project funded by ilo undp and world bank accordingly i think you can imagine and you can understand we have a very qualified and uh, knowledgeable and the 
professor lecturer who uh, can justify this lecture and uh, has the whole qualification to uh, live a lecture on this regard so i kindly so i kindly invite uh, our lecturer to uh, start the lecture over to you sir <coughs> Thank you, Chatura, uh, for the introduction. Right. I think, uh, yeah, initially what I was told that I'll be uh, given like one hour, right, for the main uh, dis uh, presentation. And after that, like half an hour discussion. Let's see, I don't have too many slides. I think around 20 slides I have. We'll, uh, I'll cover it up. After that, we will uh, have a little bit more time for the discussion, right? That is the most important thing. Right, uh, the, I mean, the uh, topic today, future of Sri Lankan economy, are we in the right track? I think, uh, you can remember uh, last year, right? Last year by uh, April, May, June, uh, there were some serious issues in, in, the, in the society. <clears throat> we, we had various experience that we, uh, the, I think uh, this was the first time we had, uh, you know, uh, such experience in the country. Now, uh, situation is a little bit different. We uh, understand that now there is no petrol, diesel queue, there is no uh, uh, gas queue, and also you are uh, milk powder queue and so on, right? And the electricity is also provided uh, providing uh, continuously. Therefore, as a, I mean, mo most of the people in the society are thinking that we are now uh, uh, in a better position than the, the pre uh, previously. That means uh, by the maybe April, May in 2022. Now let's see what what uh, I mean has been happening in the economy and also what is the future direction, right? Direction in the in the country. Okay, I don't know whether all are having some kind of economics understanding, but let me start from a very basic uh, explaining by very basic things, right? Economic crisis. I think you have heard about the various economic crises in the USA and you know Asia, uh, Asian countries and so on. But uh, the impact of those crises to a country like Sri Lanka was at the minimum level. That's why we didn't feel it, right? Uh, uh, I think uh, therefore, though this term crisis is, although we have heard it. But uh, we didn't have, you know, a very good experience about the crisis, right? The crisis is a, a situation like it's a, a drastic fall in the economic performance of the country. Now, what do you mean by the economic performance? Maybe GDP in the country, gross domestic product. Uh, uh, will be lower and inflation will be higher production level will be uh, lower in the economy. Service sectors are affected, maybe agricultural, industry, service, all sectors are affected. At the end of the day, the entire, uh, if you look at the performance of the economy, right, economy, it's a kind of drastic fall. That's how we normally define the economic crisis. This will, it increase the poverty level of a country, right? This is, I mean, uh, the end result 
of the crisis is, is the poverty. Now, there are possible, two possible reasons for the poverty, uh, not the poverty economic crisis. One is the internal issues, other is the external issues, or we call them internal shocks and external shocks, right? The shocks can be uh, actually demand-driven shocks or supply-driven shocks, right? It can be demand-driven or supply-driven, interruption of the supply or interruption of the demand. And also it can be internal, internally or external, right? But most of the, of the time, or at least until recently, this shocks is a result of the capitalist economy, right? In general, the way this capitalist economy is working, it has various type of fluctuation, right? Sometimes the economy, economic performance is, uh, uh, I mean, is getting better. Sometimes it is getting uh, worse, right? Uh, yeah, that is how it is happening. These are called sometimes the natural shocks. Then internal shocks and external shocks can be natural shocks, right? It is it is happening naturally. Uh, yes, but until uh, recently, at least some of the economists were trying to argue that there are some shocks, right? Those are the result of the policy failure, long-term policy failure. These shocks are called the man-made uh, economic crisis. Man-made, this will lead to the man-made economic crisis. Then, now look at, the, that is the crisis, right? Now in, in, in Sri Lanka at the moment, I. Rather than a crisis, we had a crisis in uh, at the beginning of two, uh, middle of 2022. Now we have passed the crisis, right? Now economy is in a collapse situation, right? That is, I mean, the uh, deep, you know, uh, depth of the crisis, right? In a deep situation. Economic collapse normally referred to a period of national regional economic breakdown where the economy is in distress for a long period, which can range from a few years to several decades. Now, this is what the experience we are having now. It's not merely an economic crisis. We are having a situation like economic collapse, right? Now look at some of the characteristics of the economic collapse, social chaos, social unrest, bankruptcies, reduced trade volumes, currency volatility, and breakdown of law and order. All are visible things, visible or invisible characteristics in our economy at the moment. Now, that is why I, I call this, this is not not just a crisis, we are in a collapsed economy at the moment. Now, what led to this collapse in, in our economy? Now we, we know that 2019, we had an Easter Sunday attack, 2020, 21 COVID-19, 2022, Russia and Ukraine. Oh. These are the three shocks that we face. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. One is the internal shocks, while others two are kind of external shocks that our economy faces. Now, I think uh, when you look at these three shocks, except the first one, other two, almost all other economies were facing these two uh, in the world, right? Then additional things that we had is the 2019 Easter Sunday attacks, right? Right. Now, with those three shocks, right, what happened to us, we, we had two types of issues. One is the long-term policy failure. That is the man-made company. 
long term policy failure. The second one is the with those crises, we had some kind of crisis responses. All these crisis responses are the short term failure of the policy. All these were, I think, failed in our economy. Then we had a long term policy failure. On the top of that, we had some kind of crisis response in the economy. All these were kind of short term uh, uh, failure of the policy as a result. The crisis started in our economy, then end result was the economic collapse, right? Now, why I, I highlighted this last component, the policy page. As I said you, 2019, except the Easter Sunday attack, all other tools are common to other countries in the world. Look at the growth of other countries when you are comparing with Sri Lanka. Right now, this is the 17 decade. I have uh, seven, uh, 10 Asian, uh, I mean, not Asian, actually, 10 countries which are more or less similar characteristics with Sri Lanka. In 1970, these are the 10 year growth rates, right? 1970s, we, our growth rate, average growth rate, rate was 4.23. We are out of 10, we are seven, right? 1980s, our position became eight because other countries uh, 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 were performing better than us. But when it comes to 1990, we became better. Our position became fifth among this, uh, these 10 countries, right? That means our performance was better. When it comes to 2000, right? We fifth, uh, sixth, our position, only one uh, country, country's performance was better than us. But when it, this is 2000, 2000 means that is 2000 to 2000, 2010 to 2019, this is the average, right? We were like six among 10 countries. But when it comes to 2020, right? 20, we became seven. Right, we became seven with the COVID nineteen. Right, there's no uh, Easter Sunday here. We had it in two thousand nineteen. That comes under two thousand ten category here. Right, therefore two thousand twenty we became seven among, uh, out of ten. Then two thousand twenty one we became eight out of ten. Then two thousand twenty we became ten out of ten. We became the la last one, right? That is why I am highlighting you, this is not key, not because of the, the other two shocks, right? This is not because of the uh, COVID-19 or, uh, you know, Ukraine, Russia, war. It's because of our own policy failure. That is why I call it man-made economic collapse, right? Look at all other countries by 2020, uh, 22, all other countries maintain a positive growth rate. While we became, we maintain a very high negative growth rate. Other countries could survive, right? With all those, uh, uh, to those shocks, but we couldn't do that, right? Why we couldn't do that? It's because of the reason that I was mentioning you earlier. Uh, it's the policy failure. Long term, we had the policy failure. Then crisis response was completely failed. As a result, uh, short term policy failure was also there. Then we end up ended with the uh, you know, very bad economic situation. Right, now, what was happening to our economy, economic growth rate after, you know, uh, 2000, 2000, uh, yes, 2000, right? This is the quarterly analysis, 2000. We had this in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth. 
quarter, 2001, fourth quarter, 2002, fourth quarter, 2003, we had on, only two quarters information, right? Data, economic growth. 2000, we had entire, I mean, all four quarters, we had a negative growth, right? 2002, 2001, two quarters we maintain a positive growth, right? Three quarters actually, first, second, and th fourth. Third quarter we had a negative growth, right? But when it comes to 2022, right? All four quarters we had a negative growth. On the top of that, 2023, both quarters, we had a negative growth, right? That means continuously, economy recorded negative growth for six quarters in Sri Lanka. That is why I said it, I call it economic collapse. This is not like a, a short-term recession or something like that. This is a kind of economic collapse because continuously, one and a half year, our economy uh, recorded a negative growth, right? Right, okay, now let's look at, uh, look at the, the, you know, 2020, uh, 2022 actually, we went to IMF, right? After that, the policymakers, until then, they didn't want to actually go to IMF. A lot of changes in the, you know, administrative structure, political structure, social structure in the economy. We went to IMF after that. We asked them to make a good plan for us. Right? They made a good plan and, uh, you know, gave to us. Now we are following, following that. We are completely put in our trust, right? Entirely put in our trust on the IMF document. Now, look at, until when it comes to 2022, we had the worst economic growth in the country, but it started decreasing 2010, right? After that, gradually, it was decreasing. Then, uh, with the IMF help, we believe that our economy is moving forward. This is what the IMF forecast, right? This is what IMF says, 2020, uh, <clears throat> 23, we went to IMF 2022, 2023, we uh, uh, had the agreement, we signed the agreement, now we are working with the IMF first install we received the first installment now second installment is also uh, going to be uh, received soon right? very soon we will these days they are having the discussion now with the IMF 2023 they says okay still minus growth right 2024 IMF says okay uh, economy started will start recovering. 2025, 2.6, and so on. It will go to, until 2028, 3.1 growth rate. Right? That is what the growth rate that they have predicted. But, uh, but they are also saying that even uh, this can be the maximum. Right? The risk is exceptionally high. Therefore, more or less, our growth rate can be less than that. Okay? But this is what our forecast with the with high risk level is. Uh, I mean, high risk level means most probably we will be unable to achieve uh, even this growth level until two thousand twenty eight, right? And yes, though domestically various economics and also internationally various economics are showing that. Okay, yeah, IMF is good. We are we, uh, that is that is uh, I mean good for for Sri Lanka, but that is not sufficient. This is required, but that is not sufficient. We have to go uh, beyond that. We have to have a kind of our own plan 
which is consistent with the you know uh, IMM policies, but there should be some additional things, right, which should be created by our own uh, you know policy makers. But we didn't do that. What we our policy maker trust is the IMF document. Okay, we will move. We'll go with this. The country will recover very soon. That's what they believe. Right. Now, look at if we go with IMF, right? What is happening? This data is not available in the original policy document. But based on their uh, you know, growth rate, you can estimate those, right? Now, if we, we had a, our GDP, right, real GDP in 2020, uh, 2018 was uh, 13,000 billion, right, 13,235 billion rupees. That is 2018, right? Now, 2023, our, you know, GDP is, this is the GDP is the aggregate value of the output, real value of the output. It becomes uh, 11,657, 2023. That is with the negative growth, right? If you go with positive growth, as mentioned by the IMF, our GDP becomes 13,291 in 2028, right? Suppose we we will look. Uh, we will assume the optimistic situation, right? Everything is going well with the IMF, right? We are we are achieving all these growth. Risk is zero. Still, what you could achieve by two thousand twenty-eight is the thirteen thousand two hundred and ninety-one. That is similar to the GDP rate, uh, level in the country in two thousand eighteen, right? That means by 2028, in terms of GDP, right? Whatever we are going to achieve is, is similar to the GDP that we had 2018. That means country, by that time, by 2028, country has gone 10 years backward, right? 10 years backward, right? Because the total output of the economy uh, we had that output even in 2018, right? That is where we are moving at the moment. That is where, what our target at the moment, right? Yes. Now we will have uh, reached the level seen in 2018, and but still, IMF document says the country's economy will regress by 10 years. Uh, it, uh, that is clear. But risks are exceptionally high. Still, it is not sure whether we could achieve this level. That is a hypothetical value, right? That's a kind of hypothetical value that we are having. Right. Now, with that, if you look at the, you know, central government debt, right, by that time, even I have this IMF document says, 2020-22, our central government debt is like was like 27,000 billion. 2023, it becomes 29,856 uh, billion. But when it comes to 2028, our debt, although we restructured our debt, under the restructured scenario, this is not the normal scenario, this is under the restructured scenario. Our debt become 44,000 billion 601, right? 44,601 billion our debt. Now look at 2000, I mean 28, GDP we achieved by 2018 level, but our debt is you know, will debt will be far higher than that level. That is where the risk in this level, right? Right. Then uh, there are some other ways of explaining the similar thing: the nominal GDP growth versus debt stock, and also 
real GDP growth rate is very low. It's like 3.1%. Uh, and debt stock uh, will increase rapidly, right? Then, uh, right, we will, you can look at the per capita debt, right? Per capita debt. This is the per capita debt. 2020, we had like uh, 700,000 approximately per capita debt. That means per family, uh, suppose four members are in the family, that means 7,000 into 4, 21,000. Uh, 24,000, uh, that is uh, 28, right? 28,000 uh, rupees, that is per family, right? Four members, family. But when, uh, anyway, per capita debt is like 700,000, 700,000 here. When it comes to 2023, that is 13, uh, this is like, you know, uh, 1.3 million, 1.3 million here, yeah, right? But when it comes to 2028, it becomes 1.9 million. That's been almost 2 million. Almost 2 million. Then let's just think about the family. That is four members family. It's like uh, 20 into 4. 80 million. That means government uh, will borrow money for your family, right? One family in this country, uh, like uh, 80, uh, at 8 million, right? 8 million uh, rupees, right? Right. That, I mean, the, it, oh, this graph clearly says that. Although we follow the IMF policies and so on, still debt burden in the country is increasing rapidly, right? Debt burden in the country is increasing rapidly. Uh, yes, per capita debt will increase by 179 between this period. Per capita central government debt. Right, central government debt will increase by 44% between 2023 and 28. Right, right now there is a high risk of accumulating debt. That is clear, that is obvious. Although we go with the IMF uh, policy document, it's stated there is a high risk in the, in the economy. Right now, will uh, with that. Uh, you know, with that, uh, I mean, uh, high risk, we uh, we look at what president was saying in this country, right? President was saying that, okay, 2048, a year of development for Sri Lanka, says president. Then we, uh, I mean, using a statistical procedure. I know that president is not using a statistical procedure. He just says it, right? based on someone else uh, probably uh, give him some details, right? But if you look at whether, if you look at what he says is true or not, you can statistically test what he's uh, telling is true or not, right? We use three main assumptions to investigate this claim. Nominal GDP growth is 8.3%, right? We can't do that unless the price is increasing rapidly, but we assume, okay, this is the, this is, uh, we, we could do that, right? Uh, we will be able to do that. Then foreign exchange depreciation, we take last 10 years, except 2022, because 2022, we had a foreign exchange a rapidly decrease. We removed that, you know, uh, uh, exceptional outliers. Then population growth, we assume the last year, last 10 year average, right? I mean, using those three assumptions, we estimated the per capita income in Sri Lanka, right? Until 2048. This is what we could achieve if we, you know, follow, uh, I mean, the if you if you if you have some kind of optimistic assumption, right? If you are using this all these optimistic assumption, 
This is the maximum we can go by 2048, right? In the World Bank, they classify countries, low income countries, let's say thousand dollar. This is dollar, right? USD, per capita income, USD. Low income country, less than one thousand uh, forty uh, five. Low middle income country, 1,046 to 4,095. This is where we are at the moment, right? This is where we are at the moment. It has some kind of purchasing parity. I, I mean, this calculation and this, this uh, classification, there is some small marginal differences, right? Marginal differences. But that is negligible, actually. Then upper middle income country, this is what the, what we need. Right? This is the per capita income we need. If, if our country is, uh, is having the per capita income in between this range, then we will be, the, be in the upper middle income country. High income country uh, greater than 12,690. Given this, this you know, classification, this scenario, and our estimation, we could go to we uh we, we will be un we will be able to reach the upper middle income country level by 2048 right that is what it basically says because ours will be 5682 that is in this rate upper middle income that is also kind of lower rate right that's mean high income or developed country is a kind of you know, miracle, right? Probably we we will be unable. To, it's a dream, right? It's a daydream. You can't you can't achieve that. There is another thing, right? Okay, now suppose World Bank is keeping this this indicator until for uh, 2048 as it is. This classification is the same. That is what our assumption. Under that assumption, you could go upper middle income level. However, World Bank, every other uh, two years, three years, or so like that, they are increasing this level, right? World Bank is increasing this level gradually. Now, 2023, we are today, but we are talking about 2048, right? 40. After another 20 to 30, uh, maybe more than 20 years. By that time, if the lower middle income category, upper limit, lower middle income, upper limit goes up to 5,700, again Sri Lanka becomes the low, lower middle income. I don't know whether you got that point. No? At the moment, they are Upper level is 4,090. With the time, this range is increasing, right? After 20 uh, years, if this range, upper limit goes greater than uh, what we achieve, then still we will be in the lower middle income category. That is the, that is the idea, right? That's when this claim is not true. You can statistically prove that. Right, now, <clears throat> uh, yes. Now let's look at what we are doing at the moment, right? Whether we are in the right track now, at least now, right? Look at the current macroeconomics indicators, sectoral growth, right? I didn't compare 2020 to 2023, uh, 22 to 20, 2023, because 2022, we had a worse scenario. Then I used 2021 to 2023 changes, right? 2021 to 2023 changes. Agriculture, in, in general, in the economy, there are three sectors. One is agriculture, then industry, then service. Agricultural sector, according to Department of Science and Statistics, there are 17 categories. Out of these 17, 
when it comes to 2023 second part uh, still nine are recorded negative drop right out of 17 19 nine sorry nine is still are negative out of 17 total you know we have 17 then out of 17 nine are recorded negative right entire sectoral negative growth is 4.53 uh, right now you can see whether we are going still we are going in the right direction or not if you look at the industry sector right 2021 to 23 second quarter industrial sector out of 17 13 are recorded negative growth right industrial sector uh, total collapse shrink, right? Uh, is like 20.5 percent total. Uh, I mean, uh, total uh, growth is negative 20.5 percent, right? Out of 17, 13 are negative. This is all these are negative. Look at construction, 35%, rubber, plastic production, mining, coin, and wood, and you know, furniture, all these have some kind of negative draw. Then the service sector, out of uh, service sector has only 15, right? Out of these 15, seven are recorded negative draw, right? Insurance, social security, financial service activity, computer programming, human health, all these are negative growth, right? Now, look what? We, 2022, we had a new regime, right? New officer came to, you know, work in different places and new political system, but with the old new bottle, but old wine. Uh, uh, they they started handling the economy, but after like one and a half years, they could not turn this economy into right direction. Right after like one and a half years, still they could not turn this economy into right direction. Policy impacts are almost zero. We are coming to a kind of natural equilibrium with adaptation. People are adapting to the various scenarios, right? That is the only positive thing. Government is trying to show that this behavior is a direct result of their cleverness, right? They took clever policies in the country. As a result, we are moving in the right direction. That's what they say. No, that is not. That is not. People are adopting to a various scenarios. Now, government make use of that for their own sake, right? Right. Now, that is the sectoral growth story. When it comes to the inflation and money supply, look at food inflation. Most people are saying that now inflation is uh, now very low. That, that is true. But that does not mean that our cost of living is less now. Right? 2001, we spent 50729 to purchase a particular basket of commodity. This is Department of Science that is that say that. We spent 50729 purchase a particular basket of commodity, but 2023 August, right? August, we have to spend 102,421, right? That means, look, we need more than double now to purchase the same commodity basket. Same commodity basket. Change is 102, right? I mean, inflation is low, but we are in an upper level. 
that is the that is the idea we are in a upper level in that level you this is like you are in a top of uh, top of the mountain you are after being top of the mountain you are looking at the height of another mountain right that is what you are we we are doing this but the government says that okay we have control inflation very well and so right inflation is control it's not because of the because of the uh, government you know policies it's because of the natural scenario natural phenomena right now look at uh, now this is what happened if i say something using this graph this pressure build rate right our inflation was very low by 2022 in order to control the inflation go what government did is central bank did this central bank increased the interest rate as a result the cost of borrowing become very high became very high this led the economic collapse this is the this is the main policy failure reason main policy failure previously we had a lot of policy failure but the new uh, regime they increase you know interest rate uh, very high as a result cost of borrowing even the government they burn increase rapidly right because government has this treasury bill treasury but government is borrowing when they earlier when they borrow 100 rupees they received 92 government receives 92 other party interest uh, goes as eight but when it comes to the middle of 2022 uh, or end of 2022 government receives only 67 other party received 32 or 33 right now this is what happened why government was you know increasing a uh, central bank increased this you know uh, interest rate argument is the control money supply control demand in the economy there was no demand driven inflation in the economy. there was no demand inflation was a result of the supply side shock, right? But central bank didn't understand that. They thought, okay, this is because of the demand, therefore we will control the money supply. That is why they increased the uh, interest rate. Now this is the money supply. There is no change, right? There is no change. I mean, because uh, money supply, when it, when it comes to, you know, July, uh, uh, 2022 uh, currency held by public there's no change and m1 uh, money supply m1 that is the most important for demand right is not changed now this is what without understand the understanding the reality of this behavior right they did this that became an uh, that the final result was the uh, negative growth in all sector because cost of borrowing is very high, right? It was very high. Right. Now, uh, uh, yeah, that is again policy failure. We had a long-term policy failure when it comes to short-term. There's a crisis response. After that, two regimes were there uh, and new previous regime also fertilizer ban and other things. There were a lot of mistakes. New regime came to power. They wanted to show that you know they are doing better. What they did deliberately, they uh, they were worsening the economy at the beginning. After that, now it, economy because if you are in a worse situation, even a small relief is very good for you. That is what the policymaker wanted to show us, right? First, they became us, they uh, made us worse after that. Now they say, so okay, we are uh, doing it properly, right? Now, yes, with that, uh, now we had two, I think I have another like 10 minutes, right? 
we had another two actually we had two issues in the economy basically right actually three issues right one is the government uh, budget deficit second one is the bop deficit balance of payment deficit other is the debt stock right high level of debt stock now we will look at whether we have corrected those things right because our economy economy collapsed because of those three fundamental reasons budget deficit issue bop issue and debt issue right now look at the budget deficit issue this is i have compared 2022 january to june period with january to june, uh, june period 2023 i think in 2023 they they started correcting the budget issue budget balance right they they started correcting it. okay now let's see whether we have corrected that is why they impose a very high tax right with those all these tax and other things we have changed our revenue by 50 percent actually total revenue that is tax revenue but if you think about the non-tax total is revenue has increased by 396 billion revenue has increased that is good right because our uh, revenue was very low expenditure was very high as a result we face the budget now now government has taken good step to increase the revenue right that is like 43 percent increase of the revenue but if you analyze the expenditure between the same period expenditure has gone up by 7730 so what happened again we are in the we we are in the same place we were because there was no relief for the budget deficit. tax has increased income has increased but more than that government expenditure has increased during why we got the you know increase our revenue useless useless increase in the revenue because expenditure has gone up more than that right it's not because of the capital expenditure that is negative that is because of the current expense. that is the worst right that is the worst. now first issue is, is still there i mean there is no relief for the budget deficit Income has increased, that is true, but expenditure has gone up more than that. What we need is, we need to increase the income, decrease the expenditure. That is what we need. But expenditure has gone up more than that, right? That means we are worsening the situation, right? Right. Uh, yes. Now, the, uh, shall I show you a small thing, right? Now look at total receipt to the government here daily figure daily government operation daily now even you think about your daily expenditure and income you have to balance it you have to balance your daily expenditure and ex income government has to balance its own daily expenditure and income this is the daily receipt right 6 billion 2019 4 billion 20 5 billion 6 billion at the moment 9 billion that is the Daily receipt. Daily payment, 12 billion, 12 billion, 13 billion, 17 billion, 21. What happened? Total gross borrowing, daily borrowing is at the moment 13 billion. Right? Can we go? Can we move forward? That is the issue. You need to understand this issue. Every day, to maintain the economy, we have to borrow 30 billion. Can we go? How far? How far can we go? Every day we have to do that, right? Now that is why I am saying we have to reduce the expenditure and increase the income. That is the way, that is how we could uh, reduce this gap, right? Okay, that is one. The second thing is fiscal policy. There are different ways you can, you know, increase the revenue. I am not going to tell you the, all those things because we have, uh, I think, uh, I am running short of time, right? Now let's come to the second point. First point I was telling you, the budget deficit issue, we could not 
attend it properly, although government is saying various things, they are saying utterly lie, right? A reality is that one is still, they, uh, you know, the difference is very high between expenditure and income, a useless increase in the revenue, uh, unless you can't cut down the expense. Second one, external sector, BOP, balance of payment. We have the tourist, you know, increasing, but not we, you know, we had in 2018, right? It's still less than that. We had, we are getting remittance, but not as we got 2020. A lot of people are going abroad. They are saving some money, but still that is not less than what we had, right, earlier. Is number of passport issued is like uh, you know over the last six months like five hundred thousand last year nine hundred thousand right almost one million per year passport issuance right the people are trying to leave the country now we are getting something from these two sources but if you think about the export and import export has decreased export revenue has gone down. And also imports has also gone down, but that is because of the uh, restriction with the with removing of all these restriction again imports expenditure will increase, right? Okay, now external sector performance is is also not in a satisfactory level. Now, uh. Look at external sector issue. I am daily imports and expenditure uh, export, right? Now this is the per, per capita uh, export and import. If you think about the per capita per day, per capita per day, right? Imports is six hundred and fifty-nine. Uh, Sorry, every day for each individual, we are spending this much of uh, this much of you know uh, value of money to import various goods to our country this is per capita per day imports right per family that is 2629 rupees that is imports right but let's look at export export is 476 ah look at export earning is less than the import earning is uh, import, you know, expenditure still. As a result, you can calculate for the family. Every day, the loss, you know, uh, from the external transaction per family in this country is 724, right? Every day, this is the loss. Every day. Every day, this is the loss per family, right? Uh, from the international trade. Our export is still uh, lower, imports is higher. As a result, we are having trouble. Every day, we are losing some money, right? Now, what we are uh, uh, importing is clear, right? Foods and vegetables, sugar. Most of these things can be produced in this country, but there is no attention because country uh, is moving down, right? Right, public third issue. Now look at first issue is clear, debt is uh, government revenue and expenditure. We haven't done anything, still we were, we are the same place. Import export handling, no, any satisfactory level. And public debt, right? Outstanding debt has increased rapidly over the last few oh, months, right? To handle this one, this is the last point that I want to make, right? Handle this one, government use domestic debt optimization, right? So many, Professor Suminasri Lianage and Dr. W. Vijayvaldana has done, have done very nice calculations. This is the, this based on the last year, right? This is what the EPM, total amount, right? And annual subscription is 193 billion, and earning from the investment 285. This is what the receiving each year, right? This is what we receive. Annual payment, right? For the members, 163 billion tax. There were tax like 14%, that is 48 billion. 
then if you add those two together that is the annual withdrawal this is the withdrawal this is the incoming amount incoming amount is greater than the withdrawal normally right if, if i have given here 3460 million annual earning 478 that is the if you add these two together it becomes 478 Annual withdrawal, that is 211 million. If you add those two together, that is the annual withdrawal, right? That means still, if there is no domestic debt optimization, there is a balance. Balance is annually, you, the fund the stock will increase by, that means our fund will increase by 267 billion. That is, return is like 7.7%. Right? Every year, fund is increasing by this. But now, under the domestic debt optimization, we had some kind of mechanism. I am not going to explain you all those things. At, uh, we have a limited time. But with this you know, scenario, 130 each year, government we, uh, is uh, government 213 as the domestic per year domestic debt of right? As a result, now you have to add this one into the withdrawal. That becomes 324, right? Then the balance will be 154, very low. Return will be 4.4%, right? Now let me explain a little bit more about this scenario, what government did. In the absence of domestic debt, restructuring or optimization, total value of the fund at the net return of 7.7 .7 will increase by 9,396 by 2,035. This will be, there is, if there is no domestic debt structuring, <laughs> it will be the size of the fund, right? But with the domestic debt restructuring or optimization, EPF would increase only to rupees 6,124 by 2,035. The difference between those two will be robbed by the government over the next few years. How much? That is like three uh, more than 3 trillion. More than 3 trillion, right? Now, there is another fallacy here. EPF tax payment are calculated on the subject of uh, on gross income, not net income. Dr. Vijay Vardhan was explaining this nicely, right? Now, look at this. EPF anyway is paying 14% tax. Other companies, well, let's say bank, bank is also, was also paying 14% tax. But suppose a similar income, Rupees billion 370, similar income. Suppose, let's say, just assume, right? Commercial bank has this income. And also, uh, EPF also having the same income. But commercial bank is taxed based on the net income. As a result, they have to pay only 2 billion. But EPF is paying tax based on the gross income. Therefore, EPF has to pay 49 billion. Look at the difference, right? Now, this is why they are they are telling completely lies, right? As a result, we, you know, uh, all the government says, okay, we have a concession in lower uh, in, uh, tax payment for EPF and so on. It's completely lies, right? Now, it's clear now, I think uh, similar income, these two firms uh, receive similar income, assume, but one is tax based on the net income, other is tax based on the gross income. That is not fair. EPF uh, is tax based on the gross income, right? Okay, my last slide. Uh, are we heading in the right direction? Last pair of two more, right? Except the default in international debt, like six billion we have defaulted, approximately. Effectiveness of the CB, Central Bank and Ministry of Finance crisis management policies is nearly zero, right? The economy has been approaching a temporary auto-recovery path. Why is this happening? 
This is why I am saying temporary auto recovery path will, those issues as the budget deficit issue and also uh, BOP issue, debt issue still are there. But now look, people go abroad, they are sending a little bit more money to our country, right? And tourists are coming a little bit more, right? These are temporary things, right? Temporary auto recovery thing. And domestic people, they are cultivating whatever they, they could, right? These are adaptation of the previous situation, right? Not the impact of the CBE or monetary policy, right? They, they, they might have some impact, but very marginal, leakage. But the issue here is the, uh, yeah, country is in auto recovery path, right? The impact of the crisis will last another few decades. That is clear because under depth optimization, you are you are not redu reducing the depth quantity of the debt. You are putting it ahead. We will pay the debt after five years, six years, seven years, something like that, right? Then that is why I am saying the uh, impact of the crisis will last another few years. I am pretty sure with another five to ten years we have to go another domestic debt restructuring, not the optimization, right? Another domestic debt restructuring, no? or, uh, uh, we have to go otherwise, there's no way to pay the debt, uh, debt. Right, last point I want to highlight to you, country has all the natural and human resources, but corrupted politicians, corrupted government officers, right? Uh, are the main reason why we are having here today. No accountability, no transparency, high corruption, right? And there is a possibility of risk of going to even this level in the future. There is a risk, right? I'm not sure saying that we, we, we are going, we are moving towards that, but still there is a possibility. Uh, with the current economic, you know, uh, management, uh, when we think about the current economic management strategies, right? I think I got like one hour. Uh, yes, 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 it's more than one hour, right? Okay, Chatra, now uh, we can open the floor for the discussion. Yes, yes, thanks so much, uh, Professor Pasant Atukorla, for your vivid. Uh, lecture presentation discussion uh, actually we all accept that sri lankan catastrophe economic catastrophe is actually as you said it's a man made one and it's a uh, governance issue so however so you explain as you explain though we uh, though we got Committed to, uh, you know, IMF uh, conditions. Still, we would be, as you said, in two, 2028. At the same point, we were in 2018. Uh, at the, uh, I mean, in terms of GDP, but in terms of debts, we are we would be more indebted. So accordingly, um, I hope you. Uh, thin, and you are of the opinion that going to IMF is uh, not a better solution. So then I would like to ask you and you, uh, your opinion, if we didn't go for IMF, uh, so what would have been the next uh, solution uh, to come out of this issue we would have got? Right. Thank, thank you, uh, Chatura. Now, I'm, I think uh, uh, my opinion, I'm, I'm not saying that going to IMF is not a good strategy, right? We are the people who force government to go to IMF. Even at that time, I was writing a number of articles to uh, show government the importance of going to the IMF. Even today, I accept that going to IMF is is, uh, I mean, it's good, it's good. But the issue is going to IMF is not sufficient to make this economy, right? 
that is good. We need those things. But in addition to that, we have to have our own plan, right? Now look at, there are two things in the economy. One is the stabilization, the stability of the economy. Other is the growth, right? Growth and stability, those are the two. Now look at the uh, uh, train. Train is going in, in a particular track, train track. Now, suppose by 2020, after 20 or something like that, we our train was off the track. Now, now what IMF did was IMF came and put our train again in, on the track, right? It's still we are using the old, you know, rail, whatever the tracks, we are moving along that that track. That is what I, I was uh, I, I could see. IMF was trying to stabilize the economy, not the growth. They don't care about the growth, right? They 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 uh, want us to stabilize our economy. But where is the growth? That should be done by our policy, our side. When they introduce the stabilization policy, we should be able to introduce the growth-oriented policy, and after that, we should move. Uh, I mean, forward, but. We still believe that stabilization policy is sufficient, IMF is sufficient, no need any growth-oriented policy. That is what the policymakers believe. That is why we are having the negative growth. <clears throat> is that sufficient, uh, Chatra? Hello? Uh, yes, yes. Uh... Yes, Professor Atugorla. Okay, I am satisfied with your uh, opinion. Yes. Uh, okay, then I ask, uh, kindly invite our audience to ask your question, make clarifications. And uh, so if you have any opinion to present. Hello, uh, sir, I'm Utpala. Uh, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. I think I can hear. Uh, you can hear me, isn't it? Yes, yes, I can hear. You. So, um, so uh, I have two questions. So, as you said, uh, what are the policy uh, decisions that the government should make uh, to develop the country in such situations? And uh, also, I'll be grateful if you can give an example uh, of another country who were in the similar situation like us and uh, who has achieve the growth uh, despite of all the uh, difficulties. So those are my two questions. And thank you very much again for your very informative presentation. Right. Uh, thank you, Pala. First uh, question, policy decision. What, what policy decision that we need to adopt to develop this country? We need to introduce the growth-oriented policy. I mean, Stabilization is being done by uh, adopting the IMF policies. In addition to that, we need to have some kind of growth-oriented policy. Now, let me tell you a very simple example. Right? Government, now, there is a landmark. These, these growth-oriented policy should be introduced uh, at the grassroots level, not the top uh, you know, down approach, what we need is a bottom-up approach, right? Now look at, let me say you, I and mean, development unit should be the village in Sri Lanka. Now look at, I, this is my own experience, I'm saying, I want to, I, I want to cultivate, right? Then I purchase a land very close to my house in Peran. Now, this is the agricultural land, any land, right? Because I want to cultivate. Then, I was trying to make a fence around the uh, land. Agricultural development officer says, no, no, you are not allowed to make a fence around your uh, land. Not, I mean, you can have a normal fence, right? Not a very strong fence with concrete and other things, right? Then what I did was, okay, nothing to do. I 
you know, uh, cult, uh, had a small fence with me, this normal fence, cultivated, spent some money to cultivate. After two or three weeks, I saw a lot of, you know, uh, animals have, they have damaged the fence. They have come to my uh, cultivation land and destroyed it. Now I gave up cultivation. Now, what is the issue? In my dad's time, there was a kind of agricultural land. At that time, there were some policies. There were some policies saying that, okay, you can't, you know, uh, have a kind of, you can't remove the uh, soil here and there from the agricultural land and so on. Still, those policies are there. What I am saying is, get rid of all those policies. Government every year, government is spending huge amount of money uh, for seeds, plants, and uh, give people for those things to increase the cultivation in the country. Where can I cultivate? People bring those things as they are free of charge and plant those things. At the end of the day, animals are coming and destroy this, right? These, this is, I mean, these are the issues that we are having at the grassroots level. We need to get rid of those issues. People who are having the, uh, you know, power, they they can get it done quickly, right? They they you know uh, uh, they fill the land. After that, they are doing whatever they want. But innocent people can't do that. They have to. There is a bribery process when you are doing that. Now this is why I am saying, if you want to develop this country. You don't need this top up, uh, top down approach. We need to understand the grassroots level issue and give the solution for those issues, right? That is very important, and uh, that is where we can start the growth. There is no additional cost for those things. You are taking, you are borrowing a lot of money, and you can, uh, you know, make various things in the country. It's useless. That is what we did now. We need to identify the ways and means, right? How we should, you know, accumulate the capital in an economy without any cost. This is the simple theory in economics. You know, we have a land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Those are the four factors. Using those, what we are lacking, we, we have enough land, we have enough labor, we have enough entrepreneurship. We don't have the capital. Then to have a growth in the economy using land, labor, and entrepreneurship, you have to create a capital surplus. That's what Marx says, right? Capital surplus. That is what you need to uh, do, right? You need to create a capital surplus. That, that, that uh, the policymakers are not attending to that one. Uh, that, is, that is why, yeah, uh, we are like this way. Uh, the second point, yeah, I, mean, I, I gave you only one example. There are so many like bureaucratic uh, system, uh, we need to change those things. Then the village level uh, boom will start, that will become a country's boom, right? Then the second point you are raising, the other countries, there are so many other countries uh, which, which are similar to Sri Lanka. This, you know, countries, almost these countries are having the similar characteristics. These policymakers can't understand, understand the reality, grassroots level issues. They think that getting IMF is, you know, uh, going to IMF is better and they, take, they make use of that money. Again, you know, there is a debt restructuring. There are so many examples, right? All are going like the same way. What I am simply saying that, unless we have high level of bribery, corruption, and you know, I don't want to say these things, right? I am having a, I am evaluating those things these days. I send you, uh, you all need to do me a small favor. I am sending you a questionnaire, huh? Google form, you need to fill it. That's on bribery and corruption issue. And yeah, all countries are like this way, especially those African countries. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we are also following the same similar policy, uh, and we will. That is why I am saying that there is a high risk of getting in, like Syria, 
and you know those countries, Lebanon and so on, right? Okay, uh, Uppala, is that uh, okay? Did you did I give yes, you? Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my last question was: uh, Do you have any example countries that who had been like us, but who has achieved the development by now? And how they have done it? Uh, I think no. I I don't think I I uh, because uh, when you come cons what what you are basically focusing development level and also countries after going to IMF, uh, uh, those countries could uh, I mean develop their country. Is that what you are asking? What I'm asking is, sir, that you said that we have, there were, con that, for example, South Korea was like us in a, uh, in a certain uh, period of time in the history. Yeah. Uh, but they have achieved development. Ah, okay, like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I got you. I think when you, Uppala, when you study the economic history. Hello. Me, Ani, Ana, Sali, Ge, Vanda, Matar, Dhan, Ben, Ani. Now, if you look at the history of most of the economies in the in the world, right, like Japan, Korea, and also even Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, right? Yeah. Uh, I think they were behind us, right? If you look at the per capita GDP in 1950, most of uh, uh, those countries were far behind us. But they gradually, they, they could develop their country with a visionary leader. That is what we need, right? We need a kind of visionary leader. They, 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 that is what the people of this country are asking, right? Though we could not find someone. Now, almost all these countries, Singapore, Th uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Pakistan, Korea is not there, Japan is not there. Japan was far behind us, right? When you think about 1950 and so on. And almost all these countries were far behind us, but today they, they, uh, have become the leaders in the in the world. How did they do that with a visionary leader? That's what we need. Even in you know your own institute, your own uh, you know province, your own region, your own country, we have to have a visionary leader. In Sri Lanka, there are two things. One is the politicians are highly corrupted. Other is the public sector officers are highly corrupted. Right? Those two, that is why we can't change this system. Right? Both categories are helping to each other. But these public sector officers, uh, when, if, if they are, they are corrupted, they are helping for their own cousin, friends, and so on. But if they find someone else is getting corrupted, getting corruption, they don't, they are working against for that. That's the mentality that we have. Now, this is where we could move forward, actually. I think if you look at the yeah, Korea, now you can see how far they have gone, right? <clears throat> Even now look at Pakistan, Bangladesh, they are also doing better than us. Now, Pakistan, their growth is, look, 6.19. They have gone to IMF. And they have a lot of issues in the country. But they are maintaining a very good growth rate in 2022. These countries can go to, you know, become the developed countries by 2048, definitely. If you maintain six, more than six growth rate. And also Bangladesh. Look at Bangladesh. Here the Bangladesh. 7.3, right? And 6.93 in 2021. Very good. All these countries are moving forward while we are going. Yeah. Okay, any other problems? Questions? 
Sir, uh, can yes. you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Sir, sir uh, now, uh, don't you think, now uh, we are, okay, I mean, I, I agree with you. We have to blame our politicians and public servants, right? They together, they work uh, towards their own benefit, not, not but not for the country. But uh, now say, don't, now we have a lot of uh, university professors like you, uh, one thing, I mean, don't they help the government to make policies and decisions and all that? And on the other hand, um, there are a lot of uh, external, that means outside the country, uh, like forces, right? Making, let's say, different, different categories of people or different organizations uh, you know, help like they show that they are helping to make policies and decisions and doing research and all that. But these external policy, uh, external people are have their own agendas, and what they show us is one thing, and what they are doing is another thing. And all of these people together, they they don't want Sri Lanka to be a developed country. Don't you think like that? Uh, I think uh, both your questions are very important. First one is the policy making level, our role. Yeah. Now, this system, now look at this system. I have given, given uh, different talks uh, related to this one, right? This system, now uh, there are, uh, you know, Professor, university uh, academics and engineers, doctors, and you know, uh, and various people like that. But most probably, we have we are we are not having. A, it's very difficult to find a professor in economics in Sri Lanka. You can find a UNP professor in economics in Sri Lanka or SLF. Uh, what, what, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, understand. Political. They are in politically, in Sri Lanka, yes, yes, right? yes, yes. That yes. is the that is that is the reason. Even engineers, UNP engineers, they are such other engineers, they are, and so this is this is the this is the situation. Ground right? reality. Now, uh, when it comes to the policy level, actually, I we I am not working uh, towards this political goal. I I am not working with politicians. But I try my best to do whatever I can. I think at the moment there are a lot of policy changes. There are significant policy changes in the economy. Like, you know, uh, one time I revealed the imports list. After that, within one, uh, one week, they changed the list. Then after that, the gold uh, coning, right? They introduced the, uh, you know, interest rate, uh, you know, uh, low level of interest rate and so on. There are some uh, ways that we can do. We don't have the connection with polit politicians, but we uh, newspapers, medias, they are giving very good, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, publicity. Yeah, publicity for my work. In that context, there are some impact, but uh, I don't think that the other way it's because if politicians are coming, to, uh, coming and saying that, okay, come and help us. Then I don't want to take that because they I know that that is not happening. They don't want to listen to us. But if they are listening what we are saying, I'm happy. We are able to work, right? But practically in, in countries like Sri Lanka, it's not happening. But the second point again, uh, you are saying there are a lot of people in external and internal who can get together and uh, force government. Now the problem I see. Now we had a uh, the Vyatmanga like this, right? Initially, at least people believe at the end of the day what happened. Now, likewise, though people are trying to get in together, it is not happening because they, the leaders and also those people are having their own agenda. Therefore, I personally don't want to, you know, support any party or any organization. Because I I know that this is Sri Lanka and people are working towards their own own agenda. Anyway, I don't. Uh, I mean, the government when actually this government now this is the reality, right? Uh, there is a I don't know whether you agree or not. There is a Kalamu society. 
Sri Lanka. This is called the Colombo Society. There's the Singhala word there, right? Uh, it, that society, there are some NGO and political crowd and this, uh, you know, top level officers in government level. They are getting the benefit of the uh, from the existing system. Therefore, they don't want to change the existing system. They are trying to maintain the existing system. This, I mean, uh, I, I saw there's a very good book uh, which was written by Sumanasri Liyanagi, right? And it basically discuss about this, how this society is behaving and, you know, what is their goal and so on. Anyway, I don't want to talk too much about that. The, go the government side, these policymakers can't understand the value of the uh, internal resources. Even I can remember previously, not this time, Tari Uttam Singh, uh, he, when he was the uh, prime minister, right? He hired a foreign team to handle the Sri Lanka. He spent a lot of money, but they didn't do anything, right? They, they, because they didn't understand the reality, the gra grassroots level reality. In order to, you, you need to first understand the reality, grassroots level issues grassroot level reality and so on, then you start uh, solving the grassroot level problem in the economy, then you, you will be able to move forward. Otherwise, I don't think so. At the moment, yes, that's how I think I can answer the question. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you don't mind, please, uh, can you, the one who, the lady who asked that question, reveal her identity. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I am Sunetra. I am a postgraduate student uh, of uh, uh, Columbia University. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Then any other question, please? I saw someone was asking the slides. Of course, I'll send this slide. And also, please do me a favor. I am sending the I am sending the survey questionnaire Google form to Chatura. Chat, I hope yeah. Chatura can circulate it among the network. Please help. Yes, me. yes. I I will uh, share it to our colleagues. Okay. Any other question, please? Right. Uh, if so, the final question again from me. That is not actually a question, just a clarification only. Now, when it comes to domestic uh, debt uh, restructuring, actually it is not a condition and commitment of the, for the you know, IMF. So it is a request and demand, not the request, demand by international money lenders. So government had obtained uh, Borrowings from not only uh, EPF, then I just want to get your opinion and clarification why government only selected EPF for the restructuring. Right. Thank you. Chatura, uh, I think my simple answer, right? Very simple answer. Now, earlier, I like it with a story, small story. Earlier, you know, we government imposed a very high income tax among the workers in this country, right? The tax rate was 36%, very high. Then at that time, we showed government with some evidence, there are some alternative ways of collecting, uh, getting the same amount of money, or more than that, right? Now, government is expecting 100 billion from this tax, high tax, right? Then 250 billion easily can be taken from uh, maintaining the, here I have given it here, maintaining the similar amount of import tax. You, you can gain annually 286 billion, right? What you need to do is main, maintain the same level of tax. But government didn't listen and they said, we asked why you did this. They said, it was the easiest way for us to do, uh, get, uh, uh, I mean, two things. It was the easiest way that we could get the 
tax money from the uh, uh, people. The other way is we could show to the uh, IMF, right, that we are implementing a very high tax rate, which is consistent with other countries. Those are the obvious two reasons. Now, coming back to the, do th that is the reason, because it's easy government is doing that, right? Coming back to the domestic debt optimization, yes, the same answer. This is the easy. Money is in the central bank. Decision makers are central bank, right? Now look at the way they, they, it's silly, the way they say, okay, central bank says that the money is maintained by the central bank, right? They say that, okay, I will give you two options. One is you could pay 30, uh, you, uh, I mean, percent of tax, right? That is one option. The other option is the, you know, uh, reissuing, right? With a low interest rate. Central bank has the money. They say, they give us the option. After that, they select one option out of those. And they implement it. How easy is that? Right? Everything is done by them. It's easy for them. That's why they have selected. Now, this is not the, because of the country, country wants to have it. This is not because we don't have any other option in the country, right? Better option in the country. There are so many options. But those are too difficult. That's why they say this is the easy way, easy thing. You can, you know, uh, you can uh, do. That's the reason they did it. That's why I'm saying. And also, if you go through, I'll, I'll show you if you want. I don't want to talk politics. They have passed all the debt burden after the next election. Right? I'll show you with the evidence, but I don't want to talk about politics. Therefore, I don't, I'm not going to tell you that story. If you look at the uh, extension, right? New assurance of the Treasury bond and Treasury bill, even central bank, right? All are after the next speech. There are some political reasons as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, um, Professor Atukurla. So I think there are no more questions and uh, no more clarifications. So you need. So um, finally, I thank so much for the uh, our invited. Uh, lecturer, guest lecturer, Professor Atukorla, despite our short uh, actually information and inform, he agreed despite his busy schedule. So I think he made all the justification actually for the topic given and we uh, were actually uh, made aware of the situation in the country and economy. So, Dr. Professor Atukurla, thanks so much. So, in the same way, I thanks all other participants, audience uh, who attended this uh, virtual seminar uh, presentation. Okay, thanks so much, everybody.